Our next conference is Roadmap to Mexico's Competitiveness and Supply Chain Integration. We also want to thank and welcome everybody who's connecting with us online. And our speaker is Helen Wang, Chairman of the Board Institute for Supply Chain Excellence and Innovation, UCSD. She has a brilliant professional career working on disruptive innovations that has brought her passion, joy, and self-fulfillment. Her experience in multinational technology companies has shaped her transformational leadership style. She helps build bridges between Silicon Valley and supply chain companies through value chain strategy and supply chain collaboration. Helen is currently teaching innovation to market and emotional intelligence at UCSC, Ratty School of Management, and gives keynote speeches and leadership work, uh, workshops worldwide. So please welcome Helen. A Japanese author, Yoshida Kenko, once said, life's most precious gift is uncertainty. Yes, we were able to manage some uncertainties in our lives until 18 months ago, when everything became unknown. How was that a gift? Well, because of the spirit of when nothing is sure, everything is possible. Today, I will be sharing learnings from our industry research project as a thank you gift to all of those who helped us. Let's begin with a short video. Powered by research leadership and technology partnership, the Institute for Supply Chain Excellence and Innovation at UCSD connects our community of students, alumni, faculty, and industry to redefine a sustainable future of supply chains. Founded by Jimmy Anklasaria, a San Diego-based entrepreneur, author, and philanthropist, ISEI is empowered by its advisory board of supply chain executives across varied industries. Together, the current chair, Helen Wang, former executive from Silicon Valley's high-tech industry, co-chair Tom Derry, CEO of ISM, and faculty director Hiruk Shin of Rady School of Management inspire a shared vision and began a new chapter for ISEI. Besides our active and devoted advisors who lead events, we are honored to welcome our new advisory members. Former Rear Admiral John Polochik, current managing director at Ernst & Young, Dan Bartell, Chief Procurement Officer of Schneider Electric, and Brian Xiu, Vice President of Operation and Supply Chain at Qualcomm. The pandemic has elevated the importance of supply chains to the corporate boardroom, the White House, and the world. It takes discipline, flexibility, and resilience to succeed in the supply chain field, and the best supply chain professionals never let a crisis go to waste. During the fall quarter of 2020, we undertook an industry-wide research project called Project PGM, Post-Globalization Movement. In December, we reported the initial findings to the United Nations, reaching more than 30 countries. In 2021, we launched ISEI's learning and research platform and hosted monthly webinars to collaborate with leading companies on autonomous driving and sustainability. We partnered with the Jacobs School of Engineering and the Haligiolu Data Science Institute on Technology and Innovation, and developed an inclusive cross-border community with corporate executives and local agencies in San Diego and Baja, California. More events about innovation, diversity, and a CPO think tank will take place in the near future. ISEI's collective community embraced our endeavors to develop the best supply chain institute on the West Coast and beyond. On behalf of ISEI, we would like to thank our Board of Advisors who bring executive leadership and industry insight to the Institute, our talented students who are learning and practicing to be the next generation of leaders, and our industry partners who are willing to share the latest real-world applications to enrich our curriculum. Without your dedication and trust, we couldn't possibly accomplish so much. With your strength and support, everything seems possible. We are ready to pivot and rise to the next level by focusing on research leadership, technology partnership, and sustainable supply chains. Thank you again, and we hope to see you at our future events.
Okay, thank you for watching the video. Um, I'd like to begin by introducing UC San Diego. UC San Diego is one of the 10 within the University of California system. Our unique location near the border of Mexico is a key feature and a differentiator. The latest ranking recognized the UC San Diego number three overall and number 11 among engineering schools in the US public universities. And the Rady School of Management ranked number 11 globally in entrepreneurship. ISEI stands for Institute for Supply Chain Excellence and Innovation. As you might see some familiar faces and names from the video, ISEI is supported by a world-class board of advisors who are corporate executives and thought leaders across industry. Developing an inclusive cross-border community is a high priority for UC San Diego, and ISEI plays a significant role in building the community through the industry project like PGM. I was fortunate enough to work for three innovative companies. My professional journey started with Foxconn's larger scale manufacturing in Southern California. We did the final assembling and testing for PC and Mac computers. Two years later, I joined Apple and helped deliver the first generation of iPhone. After developing Apple's global supply chain for more than eight years, I went to Google X the Moonshot Factory within Alphabet. When my engineering friends created radical technologies to solve some of the world's biggest problem, my team's mission was to architect the future value supply chain system. We helped to bring a range of breakthrough technologies to the world, including self-driving cars, smart glasses, internet balloons, and energy kites. Now I'm wearing multiple hats. One of them is the chair of ISEI. I act as a connector and a bridge between industry and the university. I also utilize my industry background and passion for education to design and teach courses. Last but not least, I initiated and led the PGM project with Dr. Shane at the Rady School of Management. Now you know who we are and where we came from. Let's move on to the project. Throughout my professional career, most industries and companies have enjoyed the benefits of globalization and find no reasons to make any change. After China joined the WTO in 2001, I joined Foxconn in 2003. Since then, I have enabled and witnessed the massive transition of outsourcing, offshoring, and China's epic growth. Till recent years, when the United Kingdom began to withdraw from the European Union in 2017, when the accumulated trade tension between the US and China turned into a trade war in 2018, when the COVID-19 pandemic exposed hidden risks within the existing value supply chain system, we were forced to pause and reevaluate the vision and the strategy. There is clearly a shift from globalization to something else. This year, Biden, Biden's administration and the UK's departure from the European Union opened a new chapter for the world. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, also called RCEP, between Asia-Pacific nations, including China, but excluding India, will bring new dynamics into the global value supply chain system. We set a few objectives for Project PGM. Number one, understand value supply chain movement and predict emerging trend as a trendsetter through collaborations with industry leading companies. We also wanted to utilize UC San Diego's research capabilities between multiple graduate school to make a real impact. Provided information, data, and thoughtful strategies 
to guide industry to make informative decisions. Finally, we work with a group of students each quarter, and we hope to incubate future leaders by solving complex and real-world problems. Before we dive into the details, let me explain the methodologies applied to this project. To measure competitiveness, we developed a five-dimension framework. Four out of five dimensions are to address the business environment. Top line effects reflects revenue and the company's value proposition driven by customers. Bottom line impacts earnings driven by cost. Hard power on the left hand side includes infrastructure and trade policy managed by countries and the government. On the right hand side, people and culture generate soft power. We developed a set of key attributes for each of the four dimensions and found third party data and indexing to quantify the impact. The fifth dimension is time, which is powerful by itself. In other words, companies will solve the same problems with different strategies in the short term, mid term and the long term. Okay, it sounds like a simple idea, but does it work for complex problems like PGM? Let me direct your attention to the bottom line and do a quick demo of the 5D model in China's case. Since lower cost is one of the primary benefits and driving forces for globalization, I will start from the bottom line and go through a complete cycle clockwise. To begin the cycle, China utilized its cheaper labor costs to attract supply chain companies' relocation. That's the bottom line. After joining WTO in 2001, China strengthened its hard power through free trade agreements and the decades of infrastructure improvement. That is hard power. Through outsourcing and offshoring, Foreign investment brought job opportunities, international talents, and prosperity to particular regions. Those regions developed as the supply chain cluster. As a result, income and GDP growth improved drastically, and more buying power made China a desirable market. That is the top line. Furthermore, the supply chain clusters incubated and transformed the local talent. Soft power, including human capital, innovation, and the working culture made China hard to compete. We just finished one cycle. Now, with the increased labor costs and trade tension with the US, what's next for China? Will history repeat? I suppose only time will tell. Next, I will explain how we define the global value supply chain system. In short, we call it the VSC system. There are three layers in the system. The first layer is the center triangle, which covers every company business and industry worldwide. It forms a long and continued chain from the bottom to the top, including raw material, components, sub-assembly, subsystem, sub-integrator, and final products and services. The second layer includes connectors like logistics and transportation, as well as service providers throughout the VSC system. The third layer is the largest triangle that describes the value creation from ideas to products and the supply chain integration from upstream to downstream. Together, the VSC system includes the flow of trade, the creation of value, and end-to-end -end supply chain ecosystem. 
Many industry leading companies around the globe helped us with the project. I wanted to thank you, all, of, all the executives who have supported us. We have a great representation of companies within the VSC system. However, to simplify the analysis, we grouped them into three business categories based on company specializations. Manufacturing companies provide production services and related technology to product companies. Product companies specialize in product design and IP creation and outsource manufacturing if needed. Service companies provide non-manufacturing services, such as logistics. In addition to business categories, companies further differentiate themselves from capital investment to labor intensiveness and IP strategy. With all the background information, we're ready to dive into the details of the project. For phase one of the project, we focused on four countries. From left to right, you can see their national flags, US, Mexico, China, and India. We use the PCBA to compare the cost competitiveness of these four countries and confirmed China, Mexico, and India provide comparable landed prices to the US. However, with tariffs, China loses its advantages. Next, let's look into the soft power, which takes a long time to build. Key attributes including social network, working culture, innovation, critical talent, communication, business ethics, and IP protection. I'd like to direct your attention to China first. China is doing a great job across all categories, particularly social network, innovation, and critical talent. Mexico has the best working culture, but falls behind in other categories, such as social networks and innovation. Regarding hard power, China is doing really well by establishing trade agreements, including the most recent RCEP and continued improvements on infrastructure and logistics. When it comes to government program and the regulatory quality, Mexico has a big gap compared to the US. In terms of binational relationship with the US, Mexico is a clear winner, thanks to USMCA. Overall, China has started losing its competitive edge in the bottom line. However, ease of doing business, its market size, and the growth potential strengthen China's competitiveness. The US maintains its leadership position in soft power, supported by innovation, social networks, communication, and IP protection. Mexico offers competitive cost, proximity to the US market, and it could enhance its competitiveness through soft power and hard power improvement. In summary, the US remains as an innovation leader, thanks to its strong soft power and growing market. Mexico has enormous trade potential in North America. China remains an all around performer and dominating global supply and manufacturing. Lastly, India has an untapped capacity to take shares away from China, but require major improvements of infrastructure and ease of doing business. In phase two, 
we focused on Mexico. Clusters in Mexico was identified as an area of concern. For example, Mexico did, didn't have any clusters in the top 100. Before proceeding with the analysis, I would like to define clusters. In simple words, clusters are networks of firms and manufacturers that are strongly connected within the production chain, creating value added together. Well-developed clusters can drive competitiveness and innovation, attract talent and lower costs. For example, Silicon Valley has a strong cluster in microelectronics and a capital venture. Boston has a strong cluster in biotechnology. Different certifications can measure well-developed clusters. Our analysis will look at the ESCAC certification, which is a European standard for management excellence with gold being the top tier. We found that four industries have a long history in Mexico and they represent 85% of manufacturing in Mexico. Let's take a quick look at these four industries in Mexico within the last 100 years. The automobile industry in Mexico dated back to 1925 when Ford established an assembling line. The first aerospace factory was founded in Tijuana in 1927, and in the earlier 2000s, the industry started to grow. The medical device industry dates back to 1932, and it started blooming in 2000. The electronics industry began in the 1980s and has continued to grow since then. Next, 90% of exports from manufacturing are from the border states. Texas and the Northeast Mexico border states traded 104.3 billion, with the top category being machinery and electronics. Second, come California and Baja California at 46.7 billion with the two categories being computer and electronic products, transportation equipment. Arizona and Sonora traded 9.3 billion with 27% being in the agriculture industry. And lastly, New Mexico and Chihuahua traded approximately 1.4 billion with the top category being electronics. Our analysis shows that Mexico has established clusters of four industry, especially in border areas. With more focus and improvement of programs, we think that Mexico has great potential to make some hot spots into the list of top 100 clusters. Followed by our analysis, and a five dimension framework guidance, we believe that the border states provide the best competitive advantages within Mexico. Among those states, Baja California is the winner for multiple industries. For phase three of the project, we explored the auto industry from internal combustion to alternative energies autonomous technology, and shared mobility. For more than 110 years, the auto industry has been kept in balance by the five dimensions that drive their direction over time. For example, the Ford Model T won market share in the early 20th century by its innovation assembling line operations focused on bottom line costs. As much as we like a Mustang, it was tourists 
that saved Ford from impending bankruptcy in 1985. As top line demand shifted from boxy American cars to smaller and more fuel efficient Japanese import styles. Throughout this entire time, errors come and go due in part to hard and soft power shifts. Fast forward, in efforts to reduce pollutants and greenhouse gases, alternative or renewable energy sources show significant promise in helping to reduce the number of toxins that are byproduct of energy use, such as ethanol, ethanol, natural gas, hydrogen, electricity, propane, and biodiesel. Lots of regulations are emerging in North America to achieve these efforts. The table presents different regions and the target timelines in North America to achieve 100% zero emission with new vehicle sales. Thanks to these regulations, hard power drives the growth of electrical vehicle. Vehicle registration that uses alternative fuel has increased, and electrical vehicles come second highest after flexible fuel vehicle. Meanwhile, soft power leads to emerging opportunities for autonomous vehicle. We break down technological innovation into three eras. The first era has already begun. And as we see, companies are working towards full autonomy for the consumer market. The transition between era one and two should happen in the late 2020s. With consumers beginning to adopt this technology heavily. Era three is where autonomous vehicles become the primary means of transportation for consumers. This transportation is projected to occur around 2040. On highway trucks were likely to be the first vehicle to feature the entire technology on public roads. Companies are currently developing the software algorithm needed to handle com complex driving situations. According to KPMG, the traditional value supply chain looks like a pyramid shape where automakers, original equipment manufacturing, OEMs, are the kings. There are several tiers of suppliers, ranging from raw material like steels and leather for seeds, components, and module suppliers and system suppliers. From our interview with industry experts, we also learned that the final assembling for the North American market tends to remain in North America. This makes intuitive sense. When you make bulk products, you want to integrate them close to where they are sold. Suppliers are developed around the US, Indiana, Mississippi, Canada, and Mexico. As we go further away from final assembling, sourcing becomes flexible. Companies take advantages of global talent. For example, Asia has a strong electronics industry, so it makes sense to source from Asia. The new value chain will no longer be just a pyramid. Gone are the days where the OEMs dictate how the suppliers support their manufacturing process. It will look more like a hub where there are many different players. Without any of them, the wheel would not roll. We also see big players such as technology companies, infrastructure providers, government, telecom networks play significant roles in the value supply chain. 
In conclusion, we have observed the value chain realignment and supply chain movement within the auto industry. Hard power and soft power are strong forces to shape the emerging auto industry of the future. The auto industry is just one example of many more emerging industries underway with similar trends in the future. Beyond the three phases of PGM project, I have one more thoughts to share with you. One question was triggered by my first hometown of China and my second hometown of Silicon Valley. What's in common between Silicon Valley and China's lasting success? In other words, what are the foundations for sustainable growth? Let's look at another ecosystem called the global startup ecosystems, which is defined as a cluster of startups and the related entities that draw from a shared pool of resources and generally reside within a 60 mile radius of a center point in a particular region. The goal of the ecosystem is to launch and grow companies. The pie chart shows the distribution of the top 30 ecosystems, 50% in North America, 27% in Asia, and 17% in Europe. Here is the detailed list of the top 30 of the top 100 ecosystems. The top five remain the same as number one, Silicon Valley, number two, New York and London, Thai position, number four, Beijing, number five, Boston. Note that number one, Silicon Valley, number six, Los Angeles, and number 21, San Diego are in California. And then number four, Beijing, number eight, Shanghai, number 19, Shenzhen, and the number 25, Hangzhou, are from China. For the first time, Tokyo entered the top 10 this year. Besides the top 100 list, let's also look at the top 100 emerging ecosystems. The first graph shows a big picture of Silicon Valley compared to the top 10, top 11 to 40, and then emerging 100, and then next 100. The following chart shows the breakdown of ecosystems, emerging ecosystems by region, including 5% contributions from Latin America. And I found one city from Mexico listed in the top 100 emerging ecosystem, Mexico City. As I mentioned at the opening, we are in a time of uncertainty and everything is possible. Now, what about a Cali Baja? Physically, it is formed by California in the United States and the state of Baja California in Mexico. And if we apply the strategy of borderless to combine the strengths of both Californias into one mega region, and then combined with our learnings and findings from three phases of PGM research, provided California's innovation and Baja California improved the supply chain clusters, we are probably stronger than any other ecosystem. Before conclusion, I would like to point out that our projections consider the following key assumptions, 
typically out of control of industries and companies. We assume similar challenges, conditions, and outlooks related to trade relations, frictions, and barriers. We also count high risks associated with climate change and a pandemic-like crisis. In summary, compared to the past 20 to 25 years of globalization and free trade conditions, the business environment is more dynamic, complex, and unpredictable than ever. On the one hand, the post-globalization movement requires industry and companies to A, understand and stay vigilant in trade policies and tensions to take a balanced approach between efficiency and resilience, and B, develop a regionalization model that get closer to their customers to mitigate hard power related risks. On the other hand, post-globalization presents excellent opportunities for companies to expand their global footprint and become regional value supply chain leaders. To formulate the strategies, one must deep, dive deeper to understand the trend. We listed the challenges on the left. Firstly, cost and efficiency are essential factors that would never go away. Secondly, the pandemic accelerated the risk exposure of resilience. Lastly, diversification is often the best, if not the only solution, to mitigate overall risks. Moreover, opportunities are mainly driven by market-related top-line factors. And hard power concerns mainly cost threats. As a result, we suggest the possible solutions on the right. First, Supply chain clustering helps reduce cost and improve efficiency. Secondly, proximity to the market facilitates resi resilience. Third, regional supply chain and trade policies enable diversification. The global value supply chain is a living system. Provide a trend and a strategy, we predict the evolution of value supply chain system. It's changing from a diamond shape that connects upstream to downstream players to an enlarged hub of an emerging industry. And eventually evolves to a cluster system across industry. To better illustrate the concept and the benefits of a clustering system, I would like to use a metaphor of tree versus forest. If a tree represents an industry, then a forest represents a collection of related industries. Forest creates an ecosystem to balance supply and demand and a microclimate to protect individual trees from the changing environment. I wanted to conclude my presentation by addressing the roadmap for a sustainable future. It takes a collective effort to create a clustering system or a forest. The first step is to instigate shared resources across industry to improve cost and efficiency. In our case, identify common resources among the four leading industry in Mexico. The second step is to foster value co-creation, to encourage healthy competition and enhance regional competitiveness. The third step is to develop the cluster strategy 
using the five dimension framework. And the last step is to build the innovation economy as the engine for sustainable growth. This concludes my presentation today. Thank you very much for your interest and support. And if we have time, I'm happy to take comments and a question. Thank you. Helen, and let me ask if anybody has any questions. Anybody here in the audience with questions for her? Hello. Hi, Helen. How Hello. are you? This is Carlos Caramillo. Hey, Carlos. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, bueno, bueno. hi. A ver, ¿dónde? Estamos aprendiendo estos segmentos híbridos. Eh, ¿Cómo? Hi, Helen. Yes, I can no? hear you. No, but she's in mute now. Oh, sí. Yeah. So Helen, just a quick question for you is, and I know that for the last year and months, we have been working and you have been studying Baja California. What is, what role does, you know, what are we doing good and what are we doing wrong under your perspective in Baja California? Where are our areas of opportunity? Uh, this is a great question. Can you hear me okay now? Yes. Carlos, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. We, we can hear. Okay, great. Yeah. No, this, this is. No, wait. Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, we have invested a lot of resources, you know, to study this area. Um, I think there's many things that uh, um, that leaders within this area are doing well. For example, a borderless Congress like this um, is really um, helpful to build uh, clusters um, that eventually is going to build a community and collaboration across industries to make great things happen. Um, I also think in the agencies, the local agencies that we partner with are doing fantastic job to enable companies moving to this region and help them to grow after they come here. Um, one thing that I do feel like the opportunities is probably more, um, uh, generally speaking, in the past, traditional industries are more siloed. So they work within their own industry. For example, um, aerospace may have their own regulations and then standard versus automobile is different and versus electronics and so on and so forth. Medical is another great example. But moving forward, empowered by technology and data, um, and we see more of a convergent coming. So for example, that we're talking about autonomous vehicle right now, uh, which is also autonomous uh, driving technology and uh, electronics um, specifically example would be semiconductor is going to everything um, every device every technology every product so we see more and more of those converging points um, this is why we think there's a great opportunity for industry especially the traditional industry to really pause and think about what are the commonalities among them and how can they connect together through technology and still being different with the standard and the qualities and uh, regulations, 
but I think the sharing part can be the future technology being utilized in the product. So I see that as a general opportunity for many industries as well as within this region. We have a question from Jose Marquez. Could you name the top three strategies that the Cali Baja region should implement to make this region more globally competitive? So if we look at, if we're still thinking about the value supply chain as a, a diamond, which is still the current shape for the large part of it. And uh, I think the, the Cali Baja is doing a very good job it's probably more on the uh, downstream or the middle part of it. But I think the upstream um, value supply chains that are still far away. For example, most of our electronic components, um, we still have to import um, specifically from China. So those are dependency and reliance on the technology and the manufacturing far away. So I think as a region that if we could attract and identify, we don't, we, it's impossible that we take all of the upstream here. Um, but I think the critical ones that um, shared among all the industries um, can happen here more and more. So that's one. The second part is, I think on the innovation side, which takes a long time to develop and incubate, um, a true meaning of cluster. And they, I think that needs to happen from um, the education, our future generation. You know, being in the university, um, I had, I think we're, we're looking at a very powerful next generation. I asked a question to my class of 90 plus students cr coming from all over the world, that how many of them thinking of working for a large company after they graduate? versus how many of them thinking of starting a new venture on their own. And I was very impressed by the answer. And I can see clearly a different generation is rising because 30% of them said they wanted to work for a large company, like where I come from, Apple and Google. But 70% of them said they wanted to have started a new venture after they graduate. So it's very impressive. I think the startup culture, the innovative innovative culture, the entrepreneur mindset is happening with our future generation. And we really want to um, incubate that and you know, make that um, happen. A great things happen with the future ones. So that's the second one. In terms of the third one, I think it, there's a lot of emerging industry. Um, you know, the examples would be like um, the automobile industry is a perfect one. Um, so I think within this region, we do have a lot of innovation going on. San Diego by itself, you know, are very, a, a, a big innovation hub. So how do we actually capitalize and utilize some of the innovation that we have in California and how do we partner together for the innovation plus the value supply chain clusters? I think we needed to really having a clear strategy. Again, I think the five dimension framework will work very well. We should collectively identify what are the areas that we're doing well, what are the areas that we could do better. And it's not really to benchmark with anyone else or it's not a, to look back, but it's more for forward looking where the future is um, heading to and how can we get ahead and planning ahead and be a, a strategic partnership together. So that's the three strategy that uh, on top of my We mind. have another question from Yvonne Corre. She wants to know what the biggest challenge for the IT sector in Cali Baja is. Mm. Uh, very good question. Um, I think from a technology standpoint, um, the Baja California, Mexico is not known for that, but that could be changing. Um, that if we have more um, innovation going on there, um, 
I also think in pandemic, it just pushed everybody to improve the infrastructure to get better on the IT technologies. So, um, well, the entire world, including California, including United States, including China, everybody is trying to make a better IT infrastructure. And I clearly see this is an opportunity, an even playing field for um, everybody, including um, Kalibaha region. We want to thank you very much for this interesting chat today. And we're going to ask Carlos Higuera to come up to the podium to thank you and talk to you about a recognition that will surely get to you soon. Of, of Tijuana ADC and its ally, uh, we present this award to you. Uh, we will be uh, sending this to you. Thank you so much for the information and the study that you shared with us today regarding the supply chain. Thank you so much. And this is for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm honored. Thank you.